type in a few extra words. And then I found this article that stated he was an expat who'd crossed the ditch to Australia and um, was basically a guitarist who knew nothing about anything much other than that. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. He was a guitarist. All right, so I type that in, add a bit more information. And then I find it was a band that he enjoyed for many years called Charisma. And one of his ex-bandmates has a website and had written this beautiful uh, little paragraph about spending time with this band and who was who and what was what. And he still clings to this memory of that band. So Graham definitely has left an impression on many, many people. Um, he's also been maligned um, throughout the world by people who don't want you to take this information on because it's in their best interests, um, even sometimes called science interest, that you don't believe what this man says. But I can tell you, even from what I saw last night, everything this man says is backed by fact. It's backed by stats. And he is living proof of the passion that it takes. And I believe in it. And I, I actually apply principles that I learn like this on my property and you see results straight away. So Graham Sait, thank you so much for providing your time today. And uh, we look forward to what you're going to share with us now. Thanks so much. It's been an unusual journey, but I think coming into this with um, you know, a, a bit of an academic background with the degrees in psychology and sociology, I paid my, played my way or paid my way through university playing music and then did it for a few years. Uh, so that was part of my history and my children are very musical and my son has uh, got a, a, a wonderful career in Berlin but he still works half the time with Nutritech, runs all of our IT, he's just been home with me filming for a whole new online series. In fact, I, well, I will mention at this point that if you want to sign up to my blog, which goes out to many tens of thousands of people and it is, so my ton, son tells me in the top 0.00001% of read blogs, uh, because you can go on to Google Statistics and see how long people open it, and usually it takes you 20 minutes to read my articles. Um, so it's not boring, it's not advertising, there's never advertising, it's just whatever comes into my head at the time and whatever I'm researching and whatever I want to share. And that might be about soil health, planetary health, human health is a huge part. I lecture doctors on nutrition globally, and a big part of our five-day course is, you know, you do a hair test on your first day in, uh, and then we measure blood pressure, blood oxygen, blood sugars, um, for pulse and a few other things, and you get heavy metals, uh, chemical residues, all of the minerals, uh, and so forth, and then you get a report card on the last day. Because the story is, you know, if you're going to be genuinely holistic, then the health of the farmer surely plays a role in that, and unfortunately the health of the farmers isn't that good. I don't know if you saw the insert in the weekly, basically the, the rural press have those the land, the country life and so forth right across the country. And uh, three or four years back, they included an insert, insert called Farmer's Health, a little pamphlet, a little, little booklet within the newspapers. And the first time ever that's published figures on Farmer's Health. And it was, it was just, I was amazed it didn't make headline news because the statistics were insane. It was double the levels of the major degenerative diseases that are killing us. So we're talking coronary heart disease, we're talking diabetes, um, stroke and so forth. Uh, it was three times the level of alcoholism, three times the level of depression, and four times the level of suicide of the next closest profession, which happened to be dentistry, because there's a link to mercury. Uh, so, you know, it's not the healthy, clean, green profession, and so we need to fix farmers. And so I love farmers. I'm, there's no people in the world comes even close to them, and there's no more important profession. So I dedicate a lot of my time, I'll do free talks, the stuff that I teach in human health, everyone should know it. So basically, it can make such a difference to you living a longer, happier, healthier life just to know a dozen statistics. I don't think we'll be able to get to that today, but I'm quite happy to come back at any point and conduct one of the more intensive courses, which includes that whole human health component. The two words that describe, to describe my courses globally everywhere, uh, the same words are used, and that's life-changing. People cry at the end of the courses regularly, farmers... <laughs> that haven't cried in a long time will come and hug me and cry because uh, they just didn't know this stuff and it's empowering to pick up some of this information. So I better get moving and we'll start talking, working through our way. We might not get it all done, but uh, I'll try and allow some time. And if you feel like asking a question at any point, please feel free to just put your hand up and ask that question. So we're gonna talk about building resilience. We're gonna talk about a whole bunch of strategies that I teach to beat the odds and make some money in this thing. Of course, the most important thing of all in this wonderful profession that we share, uh, we've got to make some money, you know, we've got to be profitable. And there are so many farmers that are not profitable. And the kind of strategies I teach, one of them is to think outside the box a little bit 
about the crop that you choose. I mean, why? I just scratch my head sometimes because I, my, I've got two farms. One of them at Stanthorpe, you know, we've got 3,000 trees so far we're planting each year. Uh, and then we've got 150 metre rows and lots of them uh, that we grow garlic, which is a hell of a good uh, cash crop. Uh, and then we go straight from the garlic after saw test and put a bit of compost back into those beds. Uh, we plant capsicums, real good money at the moment for capsicums, uh, tomatoes, um, silver beet and chilies and spring onions. Uh, so that goes, and then we go back into the garlic. So we've got this, and then even the, even the roof fences have got kiwi fruit on them. So you've just got this huge productivity, but a lot of diversity and cover crops even between the raised beds and, and the trees and so forth. And then my home farm, I, I'm aiming for 50 enterprises because the change I'm seeing is this move away from getting bigger or getting out, the dominant mantra of the modern agricultural machine to everywhere I travel, this let's diversify. And it's almost got to the point of diversify or get out and understanding the importance of stepping outside of the model of a fickle commodity. And you know about that because you've had years of bad sugarcane prices. So I can't understand, for example, why wouldn't you grow ginger as I do in my home? home? You can, ginger grows beautifully from here up to Cairns. Ginger, if you do it right, you can yield as high as 40 tonnes to the hectare. Now, 10 bucks a kilo, and that's cheap because you can value add it and do all sorts of things to get more than that. This year was the, was the lowest prices for all, it's $8, but at 10, well, do the sums, it's 400 grand, you don't have to sell it tomorrow, you've got four or five months, you don't have to be, you can become a price maker rather than a price taker. You know, and any of you could have a hectare of ginger in, for example. There are so many things. Industrial hemp, two crops a year from Brisbane to, I can't even begin to talk about the potential of that. I spent a lot of time with the minister in, in Spain with us spending hundreds of million dollars in recognition of the entrepreneurial possibilities of this mind-boggling crop. I will talk about it for a minute. What the hell? I haven't even started yet and I'm digressing. Uh, let's look at industrial hemp. Let's look at some of the things it can give us aside from a lot of money. Um, number one, largest single contaminant on the planet is dioxins. And the largest are class one carcinogen. They're everywhere. They're fat soluble. So even, they don't like to be called Eskimos. What is it? Inuit breast milk is considered a hazardous waste because it's accumulated that carcinogen in the breast milk because it's fat soluble and that's fat. So where does the biggest source of dioxins is from bleaching paper to turn it white. And we, spend, we use you know, hundreds of millions of tonnes a month of paper globally. Now, it takes 20 years of softwood plantation um, the same amount of paper production can come from hemp. And what you need to know is how powerful that fibre is. The world was discovered on the back of hemp. The, the sails, the ropes were hemp. Uh, the, the Magna Carta is written on hench parchments, parchment, which is in perfect condition today, several hundreds of years later. It's the most powerful fibre. I've got a hemp shirt on the farm. I've worn it for 24 years and can't make a hole in it. There's an Australian company that have just cross-woven and designed tents they're selling to doctors without borders because they get shot in their tents when they're trying to do some good work in some of these troubled areas and you can't put a bullet through cross-woven hemp. So it's a, it's a ridiculous fibre. But from a pa paper perspective, it takes four months to grow what takes 20 years, the same amount of paper production, four months versus 20 years, 60 times more efficient and you can't use dioxins on it. You can't use bleach on it, which is the dioxins where you don't really want to have bleach sitting in your laundry cupboard. Use hydrogen peroxide or something else to whiten up your sheets because that's a class one carcinogen sitting there and don't put your hands in and stir it because it's so ridiculous. It is really, really toxic material. So you use hydrogen peroxide, which is a natural substance made in our gut to bleach the paper. I mean, the difference in sustainability is mind because the difference in profitability is beyond conception, yet we're all sitting around not doing anything, but some countries have realised and we just don't happen to have a very entrepreneurial government. Uh, that's number one. You know, the, then we look at the CO2, this blanket of gases that's trapping the heat and changing the world and threatening whether we may even be here. And we say, okay, what's the largest contributor? Well, it's coal-fired power stations. What's number two? Number two is concrete. Who would have thought of that? You've got to take calcium carbonate, you've got to burn it, and the calcium, you've just released CO2 to produce calcium oxide or calcium hydroxide, and that's the second largest contributor. So then we look at hemp, this wonderful fibre combined with calcium carbonate, you don't burn it. Uh, instead, you add a binding additive and you can make hempcrete walls that are more insulating than the two most insulating building materials, which is straw bale and mud brick. So you can keep the warm in and the cold out, but you can't burn it. Now, could that be a good idea in our current world? You can put Bunsen burners under it, you can put a bonfire under it, you can't burn hempcrete. You can make a whole building with windows cut, pre-designed, slap, there's that wall, slap, there's that wall. 
that's just one of hundreds of things. Hemp fibre, uh, hemp protein. I can't, I've got a whole human health division. I've developed a whole range of human health products, including, just to let you know, an amazing prostate pro uh, pro product, which is really important because prostate cancer has just become our largest killer of men. But I can't even source hemp protein. There's so much demand for it. Uh, the oil, you know, there's, there's this whole demonization of fats that happened a while back and we suddenly realised, oh my God, our brain's 60% fat, dry weight, we need good fats. Well, there is no fat, better. It's almost as if it was a God-given thing because you can't, you know, from a nutritional science perspective, there is no better profile than hemp oil. It's just the perfect blend of, of, of all the essential fats, omega-6, omega-3, omega-9, gamma linolenic acid. They're in the perfect balance. Like I said, you couldn't get better. You can make any food. When you've got fat, protein and fibre, you, you can make anything with it. You can make bread, you can make milk, you can make any kind of food. And it's just this, and now, because people think, oh, no, you've got to jump through all these things. No, you don't. You go online, 169 bucks, you've got a hemp licence. You've got to have some way, a market for it before you grow. It's the big failing that people often have, so you've got to determine that. But there's one of the potential markets at, at the moment is uh, the seed, because the seed was $6 a kilo 18 months ago, it's now $36 a kilo, and our growers are getting like a tonne and a half, a tonne to a tonne and a half, so do the sums on that one, 1,500 times, times it's 50 grand, two crops a year. And we're talking about opportunities, you know, that aren't recognised. But anyway, we'll keep moving. Uh, any questions on that one first? <laughs> the concept, you're going to get a lot, strap yourself in. The concept of food security basically relates to the capacity of a country to feed itself in times of crisis. Uh, we, we actually produce as a country, and there's not many countries doing that, uh, quite a lot more than what we consume. We've got 135,000 Australian farmers uh, producing food to the value of 60 billion and 45 billion, that's three quarters of that we export. It's one in seven jobs are farm dependent and one in three are manufacturing jobs involve food and beverage. So it's, it's the most important. Uh, we're an agricultural economy. We've got mining, we've got tourism, which is taking a big hit, particularly now Japan and Korea are shut out as well. So Japan was second only to China as far as tourists with this, uh, this plague virus. Um, but food security means more than just feeding ourselves. Uh, surely there's an issue about we are what we eat and what we eat comes from a soil that's a shadow of what it used to be. And so that concept of Hippocrates, the founder of modern medicine, saying let your food be your medicine, and your medicine be your food. And what we see now with nutritional science almost on a daily basis, but certainly twice a week, is the science that comes through and says, oh my God, you can't get it from a bottle from the health food store or the chemist shop, uh, what's in food. If you take something like most of us are selenium deficient, for example, in fact, almost everyone in this room, I'll put my last dollar unless you're supplementing because we've got the second to lowest selenium levels in the world. And that's huge because our most important organ is not our heart, our most important organ is our liver. And the most important mineral for the most important organ is called selenium. And we don't have it, so we need to look at it. So what's the highest food source of selenium? Well, the highest by far, there's nothing even slightly close, is the Brazil nut. And when you say, okay, well, how does selenium work and how's it uptake in? Well, multiple things. They're called cofactors. That's what you find in food, everything. You don't find one B vitamin, you find the 11 or 12 B vitamins that govern the impact of the other B vitamins. Vitamin E is not one thing. It's eight forms of vitamin E and they're all found in food and they all bounce off each other to make vitamin E work. So you look at, you look at Brazil nuts and the biggest thing is vitamin E for the uptake of selenium and it's jam-packed with all eight forms because that's how it was intended. Food was supposed to be your medicine. And in many instances, it's not what it used to be. And so we need to look uh, at this chemical intervention and the effects of our health and soil health and planetary health. And we need to look a little more, and we're going to do that over the next couple of slides, about the misuse and abuse of a really important mineral. Of course, it's the most abundant mineral in the plant. So obviously, you know, we need it. If you look at the chemistry of a chloroplast, it's magnesium. So you better make sure you do your magnesium. And that's why leaf testing is so important because you can put all the nitrogen to all the trials you like, but the response is dependent upon there being magnesium for four magnesium molecules to tag, sorry, four nitrogen molecules to tag onto every magnesium molecule in the centerpiece of those sugar factories called chloroplasts and chlorophyll and the chemistry of chlorophyll. So magnesium is a huge base point that you need to have in place at high levels in the leaf. But nitrogen is important, so we, so we find, you know, if we, if a, so our approach has been globally, if a little bit works, let's put more on. Now that's called the moron approach. Uh, and there are a bunch of issues, and of course you're addressing some of those. So most widely used mineral for good reason, 
but agriculture, when we look at that greenhouse gas story, 80% of the nitrous oxide comes from agriculture. And you might say it's only 6% of the pie, big deal, but it's 310 times more thick near that pie than what CO2 is. So if we can do it better, it's something worth looking at. Now let's talk a little bit about nitrogen, two forms of nitrogen, the ammonium and the nitrate form. And really important to understand that the nitrate form is uptaken with water. If we overdo, if we're using just nitrates or even if we're overdoing urea and putting it in the soil rather than what I suggest, which is the following, and it's really important to understand when you're all saying, oh, he's talking about foliar spray. I'm not talking about foliar spray and nitrogen. I'm talking about foliar spray and urea. It is very, very specific to urea starting life as the amine form of nitrogen, you put it out in the soil, you side dress it, you do whatever, and the urease enzyme click very quickly switches it to the ammonium form, stuck on the clay, then a bunch of bugs come in called nitrifying organisms and convert it to nitrates. And now you've got an issue if you overdid it because nitrates go in with water, and if there's a whole bunch of them there, a whole bunch of water goes in, which dilutes the integrity, the nutritional integrity of the plant. The higher the water, the lower everything else. And of course, the tr technique to, know, to see and know where you're at is a simple tool called a refractometer. You squeeze a little bit of leaf. We're talking about leaf, we're not talking about the sap. Uh, we're not talking about the actual sugarcane juice. We're talking about the leaf. Squeeze a little bit of juice with a good garlic crusher, three or four drops onto the face of this little sawn off telescope. The light refracts through the dissolved solids. You're measuring your skills as a chlorophyll manager, which is one of the most important things you do when you grow a crop. You're managing that green pigment. You don't want pale colours and blotches and stripes. Uh, you want maximum product productivity through, you don't want chlorosis is what those pale colours and blotches and stripes are called. And basically you're mo monitoring your skills as a chlorophyll manager. You're managing that green pigment, that drives everything. You, want, you never want to see this chlorotic effect, chlorosis where you've lost some of that, some of those building blocks for glucose, which is what the basic thing that you're farming. So the BRICS levels will show you. If you've, if you've overdone nitrogen, you will see the BRICS levels plunge because of the uptake with the water that dilutes. The, the, sap, the light refracts through the dissolved solids in that sap and you're measuring nutrient density. You're measuring your skills as a chlorophyll manager and you'll see immediately the response that nitrogen has. And what we find with what's called BRICS levels is what you're measuring here is degrees of BRICS. The higher the level of BRICS, the lower the level of insects. And there will be no exceptions. Zero exceptions in your farming career. You've got insect pressure here and you don't have here. There will never, ever, ever be an exception. That will have a lower BRICS level every time, whether it's cane grubs, whether it's uh, whatever, borer, stem borer, whatever. You will have a lower BRICS level where you've got the biggest pressure always. And we'll talk about why that is in a moment. So, you know, it's, for, many, for many, this is, can be a penny dropping experience. So that dilution effects reduces the resilience of the plant. We increase our global requirements. We put on more chemicals every year and every year pest and disease increases year by year. Now every culture prior to ours at some point has asked the question, what does the next generation inherit? Now there's not been a lot of studies into uh, chemical residues on food, but the one that I'm familiar with, 1,400 kids in the US, 700 from towns, 700 from rural areas, and they looked at the presence of the 13 most commonly used chemicals that we all use. The fungicides, pesticides, herbicides, nematicides, a wormicide, we pour down the cattle's throat and to the horror of the researchers, looking at blood, looking at urine and looking at tissue testing, they couldn't find one child of 1,400 who didn't have unacceptable levels according to FDA standards of all 13 farm chemicals. For God's sake, if we can do it better, we need to be looking at the science. And what I'm suggesting to you, is doing, it, doing it better doesn't involve a sacrifice. This is one of the most powerful win-win scenarios. You had to be at my conference last week or any of the conferences that I conduct to see the scale that goes, look, I work with green yard farms. Green yard farms are $6.6 .6 billion. They've, the highest Dupree brought me over, he said, look, we all know the upper management understand that this is the shape of the future or there isn't much of one, but we've got a problem because all of our farm managers are chemically trained and all of our agronomists are chemically trained. We need a credible evangelist and we think you're the bloke. So I've got to go back over and I'm training all of their people. They've sent the son and daughter who have both got ag degrees to all of my UK talks, but they're in multiple countries. The Dole Corporation, three trainings. Driscoll's Berries, 3.5 billion. I've been twice in the last two years to train their people. Driscoll's Berries, the largest berry growers on the planet, but one billion of their turnover is organic, and here it is. The organic division out yielded by 11% the conventional division. And so their game plan now is within five years to be 100% organic. They won't succeed because some of the areas are too close to heavily chemically farmed soils and they won't get 
full organic conversion, but people think it's an old school concept. So if I do these more sustainable things, I'm going to lose, I'm going to pay a price. No, you're not. There's no reason ever that you should do less. It's just a different road to Rome and you need to, how to learn how to walk that road. And you just see the example of the largest organic growers and, the, and they're brilliant growers. Believe me, Driscoll's are a really good operation. The largest organic growers on the, on the planet out yielding their conventional with organics. So don't ever tell me that nonsense because I've seen it everywhere. So you get passionate when you see this stuff and you think people just don't know. They're fed this bullshit by people with vested interests. You can't do this. Yes, you can. And you need to learn how to do that. So let's look at N and sustainability. So it's not just with nitrogen that we're contributing 80% of the nitrous oxide, 310 times more thickening, but it's a dual effect. And here is a really, the question is how do we go if we understand that the lion's share of what's up there, almost double everything else we've done, was in the soil, there's a carbon cycle of carbons in the soil, like in the living things or it's in the atmosphere, and two thirds of the largest storehouses now in the atmosphere. Well, how do we lose that? What do we do to lose that much organic matter is an obvious question. And there are things like cultivation, and it's why no-till is absolutely without the slightest argument, or at least minimum till is the way to go because every time you disturb the soil, every time you open the soil, you oxidise some carbon. If you do that wet, and how can you not do it wet in some of these regions, you quadruple the loss of humus every time you open it. You know? And then there's the stable humus that lasts for 35 years created by fungi, and they hate disturbance. They don't, like, they don't like the intrusion of cold steel. They don't like to be sliced and diced on a regular basis. So uh, no-till and minimum till is huge from that perspective, but that's not the biggest player in how we lost two-thirds, 476 gigatons of gas that's up there versus 250 from everything else we've done. So it's a huge, huge player. The bigger player in that equation is mismanagement of nitrogen. So it's not just we put up nitrous oxide, but we burned out carbon for every kilogram and there's radioactive tag and there's been three or four published studies on it uh, of nitrogen above what that plant needs. And your young plant, you know, if you're starting from scratch with the billet, that young crop doesn't need hundreds of kilos of nitrogen at that point. You know, it's, it's when we put on the nitrogen. A broad acre crop, you're putting a couple of hundred kilos of MPK, you've got a, a completely enclosed little plant inside that seed case. Yeah, it needs a little touch up. It needs nothing like that amount of N at that point. It's when you put it on. And so that's an example of many kilograms over and above what the plant actually requires at that point. And when you do that, every kilogram burns 100 kilograms of carbon that ends up in the atmosphere. You can say, oh, how's that working? How could that, how, here's how it works. Every creature has what's called a carbon to nitrogen ratio. Now, our carbon to nitrogen ratio is 30 to 1. Nematodes are 100 to 1. Protozoa are 30 to 1. Bacteria, 500,000 of these tiny creatures on a pinhead, but two and a half tonnes in a healthy soil of bacteria. This is serious underground livestock. They have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 5 to 1. So nothing comes close to that. That's, it means 5 and 1, 6 into 100, 17% of that little body, but two and a half tonnes per hectare, 17% is nitrogen. Uh, so it means they like this protein. So they love nitrogen. So you put out some urea, woof, you can measure bacterial biomass immediately afterwards and see this huge explosion. They just subdivide in every 20 minutes. You just gave them their favourite food. And then they say, well, I've got to balance. I've had my, my main course. Now I need some dessert. I've got to balance myself out. Uh, and so they turn on. Now, it's so basic if... If we thought it through and it had been genuine, genuine science, that recognition would have been there. You can't put out nitrogen without carbon because if you do, they would never choose to eat themselves out of house and home. They built humus. Humus is their home base. They don't, you don't eat your humus, but you die if you don't. So you don't get a choice if there's no carbon source included. That carbon source could be molasses, which is a dense carbon source. It could be humates. It could be manure. It could be compost. It could be uh, trash that's remaining, whatever, but there's got to be a carbon source uh, to avoid this, this, this impact, which is this one kilogram produces 100 kilograms of lost carbon. Then we've got nit nitrates contaminated in our waterways, our groundwater and Australia organics have to just turn their head and say, no, we didn't see that, mate, to even allow organics under their certification deal. Uh, the, the amount of nitrates that's in almost every irrigation water for many of them is above the level, so no one looks there. And I'm not saying it's any problem because it's only small amounts anyway, but it is a problem in the fact that it is one of the world's most potent carcinogens. I don't know if you know the fact, but there's over 200 published papers. Professor Otto Warburg won his Nobel Prize for discovering 
the root cause of cancer. The root cause of cancer was anaerobism. The blood can't carry enough oxygen around to satisfy all the cells. Well, what does nitrogen do or nitrates do specifically in your blood? Reduce the blood's capacity to carry oxygen. That's why they're a carcinogen. And that's why the World Health Organization told us last year, stop eating so much bacon and ham, which is hard for some of you Italians with your processed meat, but sodium nitrate is not a good thing to be consuming too much of uh, because it's a carcinogen and it will give you cancer at some point if you overdo it. So we don't want those nitrates, that removal of blood, of oxygen from our blood. And then we say, you know, this link between excess nitrogen, you've all seen it. When you overdo nitrogen, you've seen that link to pests and diseases. Why is that happening? Now, I argue constantly that we've got a perfect blueprint, that nature is the perfect blueprint. It's absolutely mind-bogglingly, amazingly wondrous than we were supposed to learn from it, not say we can do better than that because we can't. And that's one of the huge things to recognise. The definition of the word science, as I said last night in Webster's Dictionary, is adherence to natural laws and principles. Is there, you're supposed to work with it, not against it. And many of the things we've done in the name of medical, veterinary, agricultural science, even when we look at the veterinary story, dogs in 1900 lived to 18 on average. The genetic potential of a dog, perhaps not some of the new hybrid poodles or whatever, uh, the genetic potential of a dog is 23 because dogs have lived till 23. Uh, in, a, in 1900, 18 was the average age. 2010, eight is the average age. So how can you say, as a vet, say, oh, I did a pretty good job there, took them from 18 down to eight. It's kind of a pathetic indictment of a symptom treating deal. We've done it in agriculture, we've done it in human health where our medicine's now our third largest killer. We've done it in agriculture, we put more and more on for less response. At some point, we've got to say, isn't it time we got back to root causes? It's not bad luck when you get cancer. It's not, oh, I had bad luck, bad season, I got this, uh, this rust or I got whatever disease through the crop. It's not bad luck, there's always a reason. And that reason invariably is linked to nutrition. That's what we call what we do, nutrition farming. We've certified that term globally. Uh, there's a certificate in nutrition farming, it's what my five-day course is. And nutrition in the soil is minerals, microbes, and humus, and how those three things interplay. And there's huge relationships between all interplay between the three. In humans, it's nutrients and it's microbes. It's a very strong link. There's no humus in the equation, but there's the other two parts are hugely understanding that we've got 10 times more of them in our 30-foot digestive tract. Your skin has 6 billion organisms per square centimetre, and you might say, get those filthy things off there and hop into a bath of Dettol morning and night. You last six days and you die, you just killed your protective biofilm. We live in a synergistic relationship with these organisms, just as the plant feeds 30% of its total production to look after those organisms. You look after me, I look after you, is how the deal works. And it's just understanding how a natural system works. And working with that system is the basis. So if you subscribe to my belief that it's a perfect blueprint, you might say, well, why did God or whoever you think did it put uh, insects into the scheme of things? Because I don't believe we're another animal. You know, everyone says, oh, we're an animal. Yeah, we are, but we're a bit special. Now, that might be egocentric. You might totally disagree, and I totally acknowledge your opinion. But I personally feel deep within that we're not just another animal. We, I very much subscribe uh, to the suggestion that, you know, we, it's our relationship with God and nature and God are so intimately connected. That's where I am at peace with the world is when I'm on my farms. All I'd like to do if I had my choice would be to farm because I've never had more fun in my life than doing that. And people have no conception of how privileged they are to be doing this job. You think of the average person, I know all my mates and what they do, they sit for an hour and a half in traffic They've got someone right next to them either side, squaring at a, staring at a square box in an air-conditioned room all day. It's not even, it's only a half-life compared to living on the farm. You, don't, you have to be appreciative of where you're at. Anyway, I won't digress into that. Um, so, if it's a perfect blueprint, why did God or whoever put these little sapsuckers and diseases and all these things and so forth into the equation, so we can make some money and produce some food we've had to come out or think we had to, and bring all these chemicals and we're demonstrably killing our children. Leukemia is the largest killer of our children. There is no debates. There's zero debates about the link between environmental chemicals and the largest killer of our kids. Zero debates. Um, so what I'm saying is what's the role of insects? The man who's demonstrated that more ably than any is a guy called Professor Phil Callahan. Now he's no uh, lack of credibility. We're talking about a man with six doctorates, chemistry, biochemistry, physics, biophysics, entomology, 
and a sixth that I can never remember. Um, 212 peer-reviewed published papers, 23 books published in 27 languages. And Phil Callahan, um, an amazing piece of work from Phil, involved a book called Tuning Into Nature. And what Phil revealed to the world using those five degrees I just described was a couple of things. The feelers on insects are not feelers at all. The feelers on insects are incredibly complex antennae that make a television aerial look like a kindergarten toy. And you can see it, and I can show pictures, and they're all different, but they're obviously massively complex antennae. He also showed the plants emit infrared radiation, and a healthy, well-balanced plant sends it, of course, we film it now with drones and pick up problem areas relative to it. But a healthy, well-balanced plant sends a steady flow of, of infrared radiation, and an unbalanced plant, often because we overpacked it with nitrates with the water that took it in, or we just neglected trace minerals or whatever, sends out a staccato flow, zzz, 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 and the insect flying over, with his antennae, what are the antennae for? For a whole range of things, picking up pheromones from others and say, who can I mate with? Well, there's where I can mate with. But most importantly, these antennae pick up infrared radiation. So the insect's flying across your crop and it's a well-balanced crop and it says, no, that's not my role in the scheme of things. It flies across a crop that you've overdone the nitrogen or whatever or just neglected it. There's that stick. Yes! And then he comes to perform his role in the scheme of things. Insects are garbage collectors grow garbage, and the garbage collector arrives inevitably to take out that garbage. Now, what evidence is there of that visual that you want to check? Go online and check multiple photos of global locust plagues. Look at some of the ones in Australia in the last two years, massive ones happening as we speak in Africa, uh, and watch them skirt completely a hybrid's paddock because they picked it up. That's not my food. That's not my role. And so you're thinking, what? So if I stop growing garbage, I went, yes, it is as simple as that. But then how do I not grow garbage becomes the next question, so let's move on and talk about that. So basically, from a nitrogen management perspective, huge role in whether you're growing garbage or not, that's the price you pay if you overdo it or underdo it. Because if you underdo nitrogen, and many organic people fall into that trap, basically what you've got is a plant starving for nitrogen, and everything in the plant, in fact, everything in your body is driven by enzymes. And enzymes are made from proteins, and proteins are made from nitrogen. So what happens when you're deficient in nitrogen? Basically, the plant will, will, will mine, will cannibalise enzymes to give itself enough nitrogen for its main functions. And now things stop. The wheels start falling off. Of course, the most important, which is completely enzyme-driven, is the process of photosynthesis. So you stop photosynthesizing. Even, even rhizobium and the nodules of legumes at that point stop. Even you think, how does that work? They stop fixing nitrogen. The whole thing, disease comes in because you've got no disease protection, which is an enzyme-driven system, and the wheels fall off. So underdoing nitrogen is real serious, but most commonly we overdo it. So how can we figure out what the sweet spot is so we don't overdo it? We utilise a simple tool called a nitrogen meter. You squeeze a little bit of juice uh, with your, your heavy-duty Xylus, the, the Swiss company who make really good garlic crushes, otherwise they just break every time you use them. And, you, and you'll have guidelines for it. And you squeeze a little bit three, three into this little sink, three drops, uh, and you're going to find where the sweet spot for you, and it'll vary in different crops, and it'll depend on organic matter and conditions, uh, and conditions, soil conditions, soil types on your farm and so forth. So there'll be slightly different sweet spots across regions. But you find out where it needs to be, quite different after flowering, but it's not so important for cane. But, you know, if you're in an orchard crop or any other crop where you've got a, a vegetative reproductive a clear cycle, nitrogen falls way back from flowering onwards and potassium takes over. But you find out where you need to be and that's the spot you don't go below and you don't go above. And how do you do that? Well, you cross-reference. You can do some tissue testing. You can find where the crop looks healthiest and most disease resistant, where you've got the highest bricks level, where you've got the perfect sap pH. Now, what's sap pH and what am I talking about there? This is another new concept, brilliant, from a great friend of mine who's no longer with us, um, Dr. Bruce Tanio. And Bruce showed us that if we can, me again, measure just the leaf uh, and the healthy plant, the disease-resistant plant, the most productive plant has a sap pH of 6.4. Now, interestingly, the perfect soil pH, where everything is most available, is 6.4. If you were to check, check, which you will do if you come and do my course, your saliva or urine, first thing in the morning, the healthy human, 6.4. A cell is a cell is a cell. So 6.4 is the disease zone. I have, is the disease free zone. I have not seen an exception, and I know of no consultant globally, and there are tens of thousands of us now using this, this technology, 
who has ever seen a plant with a disease at 6.4. So you use that to cross-reference. Where's my nitrogen? Where's my nitrate levels? I want to find where they are on a conventional leaf test. Where's my nitrogen meter tell me they are? Where does the Brix meter tell me that? Where's the SAP pH and where does it closest? And that's my sweet spot. And it might be 1,600 parts per million. You don't go below that, you don't go above that, and you can measure it in one minute. So that's fingertip control of a very important mineral called nitrogen. Now, in-field testing. Now, this little refractometer does this. What you look, what you see. I can't even see the screens, but you can see those two uh, old-school fuel tanks is what they look like. The most important mineral is not N, it's not P, it's not K. In fact, the most important nutrient is, no, is not a mineral, it's oxygen. Oxygen is the most important thing for all living creatures, including the organisms around the roots. And you know how important it is for yourself because you put your fingers over your nose and block off your airways. You've got two minutes unless you're a pearl diver. So oxygen is for every living creature. It's the most important thing. So we mentioned you're, man you're managing chlorophyll, but your second principal role, and you've just got to master two things. Well, that's not hard, but it is. It's a little bit more difficult than what I'm making it sound, as most things are. Uh, but you're managing chlorophyll and... <coughs> Sorry, I'll just have a mouthful of water. You're managing gas exchange. What's gas exchange? There's a thing called diffusion. It's a law that states that gases, even water, will go, move from high concentration to low concentration. You've got an air, an atmosphere filled with oxygen, and oxygen can't help itself. It diffuses down to the, if the soil is open and friable. Oxygen moves down, the organisms use, use it, and the roots themselves use it for everything, then they breathe out. And they breathe out CO2, and CO2, of course, is a gas that is now in higher concentrations in the root zone, so it diffuses out, and the plant, if it's friable enough to do that well, the plant leaf, thousands of tiny little pores called stomates, sucks up that CO2, combines it with water, combines it with sunlight, and produces glucose, and that's how you grow stuff. And the better you manage gas exchange, the better you do. So when you see water lying on fields, that's pretty poor management. So what governs that friability, that crumb structure. You've got, you've got bacteria that create a, an exudate that creates a tiny little crumb, a little aggregate, and the fungi wrap that up, sometimes tie in here, Mr. Clay, and create these larger crumbs. That's the d most desirable. That's the absolute holy grail of regenerative agriculture. You've got a soil, you can run your arm to its elbow with this crumb structure. Plant roots move through unimpeded. Water comes in, CO2 comes out for photosynthesis, oxygen moves freely, beneficial nematodes, which are 80% of the nematodes in your soil, earthworms move unimpeded, they love those soils. You don't get better, you can't buy that from a bag. That comes from bacteria creating their little grain and fungi, and that's the big story I want you to take home. Nothing other than that word and your need for it on your farms, because most of what you're describing relates to a lack of it. Just start doing as part of this group tests, soil life tests, and find out how deficient you are in fungi because you all are seriously deficient in fungi because crumb structure is two things. It's a biological and a physical. The physical story relates to the most important ratio and often neglected in your industry. The most important ratio of six ratios that we teach is called the calcium to magnesium ratio. And why is that important? I'll put this down for a minute so I can describe it. In fact, Dolph, is this working? No, it's not. Um, Okay, let's talk about how and why the calcium to magnesium rate. It's all about your capacity of your soil to breathe. And here's the story. Every mineral, they're called ions, um, so there's positively charged minerals called cations and negatively charged called anions, but every mineral's got what's called an ionic radius. It's how big is the ball? Calcium's a big ball. Think of calcium as a beach ball. It's called a divalent cation. So it's got a positive on each side of the beach ball, grabs hold of a little particle of clay on each side and pushes apart the clay. That's called flocculation. And now in comes the oxygen and out goes the CO2. Now magnesium, what's magnesium got to do with the deal? Magnesium's a golf ball compared to that beach ball. Double positive, grabs clay one side, grabs it the other side, and you just tighten your soil if you've got high magnesium. You're walking around on platform shoes in the wet. It's a Sunday soil. You work at Saturday, plant at Sunday, Monday, it's already tightened over. Uh, it's a high magnesium. That soil's not breathing and it's not very good from a biological perspective. It's certainly not infiltrating water. Uh, very well at all. So you might say, forget the magnesium, then I'll just do the calcium, I'll flocculate my whole soil, but you can't forget the magnesium because you're doing two things. You're taking care of gas exchange, oxygen in, CO2 out, and chlorophyll management. Wait a minute, the centerpiece of chlorophyll is magnesium, you can't forget the magnesium. 
So you design your nutrition programs around achieving, and it's different in different soil types. In a light sandy soil, the ratio between calcium and magnesium that's considered ideal might be three to one. It might be 60% base saturation. We'll talk about what that is later if you don't know and 20% magnesium, three to one in a sandy soil, because you want magnesium to give you some structure in a soil that has none. In a light sandy soil, my stand soil, soils are that soil, and three to one's what we chase there. But the heavier the clay, the higher it rises, four or five, 5.5, 6.2, seven to one in a heavy clay soil, lots more calcium to push it apart and less magnesium. So that's the calcium to magnesium ratio. First thing you ever do on a nutrition program is fix your ratio, or address if you can't afford to fix the ratio, address with a bit of calnitrate and a bit of folic acid, collated calcium to at least give you calcium in that equation to counter uh, some of the problems associated with that. So how do you monitor calcium? Well, you can do leaf tests, but you can also use your refractometer, and it's yet another valuable thing. You're looking at those two, and I can't see the slides, but I'm looking down here and seeing them. Um, what you never want to see is, I don't know whether it'll be your left or right, but the low bricks, which is about four there by the look of it, one, two, three, four, um, that sharp distinction is a classic symptom. It's not 100%, but it's 95, that that's a calcium deficiency. You never want to see that in your cane ever. Your most important mineral, calcium, the trucker of all minerals, governs the uptake of seven other minerals. Why you do calcium first? And if you overdo calcium, because you don't understand how much is required, how much clay you've got to hold on to calcium in your soil, and there's an ideal level for every soil, and that's why you need to have good soil tests like our soil therapy programs that'll explain that, or good consultants who understand that balance equation. Um, but basically, if you overdo lumps, you, your soil can hold two and a half tonnes to fill up the spaces to give you the nice ratio and the ni nice percentage of calcium stuck on that clay. And you put four tonnes on because if a little bit's good, let's put more on. That's worse than not liming because calcium directly impacts and stimulates the uptake of seven minerals. If you overdo it, it antagonises the uptake of those same seven. So you really shot yourself in the foot when you're overlimed. So it's another mineral that we need to get right. But it's hugely important because, as we said, it governs the soil. And your measurement of it is that you want to see the shot, which is 12 bricks, which is a reasonable good bricks level, highly productive crop, highly resistant crop, and it's a fuzzy separation between the two hemispheres. That's your guideline for calcium. That's what you always want to see every time you look through a refractometer. You want that fuzz. That's what you're looking for. Now, the other thing, and it's really important relative to the importance of calcium, is you can do all the liming in the world, um, but you can't forget the mineral that governs the performance of calcium. So all minerals, no mineral is an island. Every mineral impacts positively or negatively the uptake of one, two, or in the case of calcium, seven other minerals. But calcium, the most important of all minerals in our body, in our body, the calcium to magnesium ratio is the single most important ratio. Magnesium's inside your cells 10,000 times more ideally than calcium. Calcium's not even supposed to be in there at all. But... The ratio determines, if we've got uh, low magnesium, we keep on pouring in the dairy products like the Kiwis do because they've got low magnesium soils, they've got the highest coronary heart disease rate in the world. Uh, and so what happens if you, if you take, say, oh, I've got low bone density on my scan, so I'll take calcium and your low magnesium and you worsen your CalMag ratio, then you get what's called calcification, where calcium comes into a low magnesium environment, into the cell, that's called hardening of the arteries, which is our fifth largest killer. So we don't want to get calcium wrong in our bodies either. But, and in our bodies is very similarly linked, uh, calcium, the, there's a hugely powerful trace mineral synergist that governs. We call calcium the trucker of all minerals, but the finish of that statement is calcium, the trucker of all minerals, and boron, the steering wheel. You've got to start looking at boron. We see it everywhere. It leaches. It's only held in the soil by humus. Humus is the boron storehouse. It's a neg negatively charged anion that leaches in the absence of humus. So most of you are going to need boron, and that's why you need tissue testing to quantify but you can do it with a refractometer and get some kind of guidelines because basically you can see the little chart, I can't point to it with a pointer there, where we've got the chloroplast, we've got the, this little sugar factory and at about quarter to five every evening a little trap door opens and the glucose you produce is pumped around that plant. Some of it's, in fact, 60% of it's pumped down to the roots and then 30% of the total is pumped out from the roots and this give and you should receive deal where you look after the microbes and they look after you. But you can see the boron, uh, that trap door, that's governed by boron. And if you test your bricks in the late afternoon, which is where it will be higher, so I always do that so I feel good about myself, and you say you've got a 12 or a 14 bricks in the afternoon, uh, in the morning that should be 9 or 10, depending on whether it started off as 12 or 14, because you've pumped down those sugars and you're measuring sugars amongst other things when you measure bricks. If it's the same in the morning, then the trapdoor didn't open and that's a boron deficiency. And you better do something reasonably soon at that point because you just stop feeding the soil life 
and the wheels fall off shortly thereafter because they're doing a lot of work for you, including protecting from disease, fixing nitrogen, solubilizing phosphorus, solubilizing potassium, making every mineral available and producing a whole range of biochemicals that stimulate your crop. I look after you, you look after me, you feed me, I'll give you the stuff back. So uh, boron can be monitored with a refractometer. You can also check through the plant. Normally, if we're going to test anything, including leaf tests, you're going to take the first fully developed leaf. That's the leaf that's been used. There's 35 years of, of science behind dry leaf analysis. That's the leaf that you use that all of, everything's based on. And when you're doing monitoring with any of these tools, you take that first fully developed leaf. But sometimes you say, okay, I'll do the top, I'll do the bottom, I'll do the sides. And they need to be the same if you've got a balanced plant. And if they're completely out of whack with each other, you know, you need to look at your nutrition in a little more depth, perhaps to a leaf analysis at that point. Determining foliar effect, if you're gonna get into foliar spray. Now look, you know, you've gotta see Saskatchewan since I started traveling there uh, five years back every year twice. Uh, these massive broad acre rigs, and we're talking about 20,000 acre average size of farms. We're talking about the national saying is that, you know, there's nothing, there's no trees, there's nothing. You just, they say you can watch your dog run away from home for three weeks. Uh, not that you'd say, well, why is your dog running away from home? Because anyway, you don't ask that. That's the national saying. Uh, but, but they've switched all their fungicides, these guys, and they're using foliars and they're doing leaf tests and they're putting out the nutrition so they don't have the fungal pressure and insect pressure and they do get substantial yield increases. Uh, switching over. The, 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 um, the Victorian No-Till Association doing the same thing. They've all embraced foliars. And this isn't just foliar nutrition. This is foliar 10 to 12 times, 15 some say, more efficient going directly in through the leaf. Underside of the leaf normally, but the cane is a grass, so it's on both sides of the leaf, so no worries, you can get out there easily. Tremendously effective way to lift yield and boost resilience. Uh, you can check your weeds. You walk amongst the crop and you've got uh, you know, a bunch of weeds, you test the, your cane, you test the weed, the weed should have a much lower bricks level than the cane, always. If it's an avocado tree, you should have much lower bricks level. Otherwise, you're fertilizing for the weed. Now, there's a whole segment. Every re weed has a purpose. Every weed has an indication. They're a signpost. Often we shoot the messenger uh, when perhaps we can learn a little from that weed and its presence on your property. There are weeds that grow in the absence of sulfur. Weeds very commonly, broadleaf weeds that grow in the absence of calcium and boron and so forth. And so it's quite good if we're going to get back to root causes that we go as deep as that and you learn all of those things in the longer course. So currently, uh, N accounts for N losses, which is not a good story. So some of it's volatilization, some of it's leaching, about 50% of what we put on. There's another thing you need to know about, and this is as important as all the rest of the stuff I'm trying to teach you, is that we're supposed to get a, a large percentage of our nitrogen for free. I call it the free gift. Above every hectare, 74,000 tonnes of nitrogen gas hovers above every hectare. It's the most abundant gas in the atmosphere. There are 5,000 truckloads of urea equivalent sitting above every hectare, and you're supposed to be getting a bunch of that stuff. So what governs whether or not you can access what I call the free gift? Now, I travelled to, to Cuba to look at the sugar cane and why are they out yielding us? Why did they win the Nobel Prize? None of them speak English. I had to take a translator to their research institutes. I thought it was my idea that I'd factored these five things that you need to tick the box and say, yes, I've unlocked the key, I can get my free stuff. You need five things in place to do that. I walk around their things, I translate, here's my five, and they all said, yeah, yeah, we do that. They already knew it, so nothing's new. It's just, it was just common sense if you think it through. And we'll talk about what those five things that you need to have in place. And it's not just about accessing nitrogen that you don't have to pay for from a bag. It's the ratio between ammonium and nitrate nitrogen in the plant that has a huge impact on plant resilience and your need to come in with chemicals. In the soil, it's a one-to-one. -one. We don't want more than 20 parts per million of ammonium and nitrate, and that's max. 10 will do it most times, and that depends on how much humus you've got recycling both forms of nitrogen. But in the leaf, it's three parts ammonium we're seeking and one part nitrate, and, you will ne and that's a resilience ratio that is really important about your need to come in with chemical intervention. And you will never, ever get there if you're not getting your free stuff because it comes in the ammonium form and it comes directly into the soil and into the leaf. So we've got this rhizosphere, these organisms crowding around the root waiting for their daily feed. And then you've got the phylosphere, the whole leaf surface is smothered in biology, fed with tiny little carbon exudates. And amongst those are nitrogen fixes that will fix nitrogen directly from the atmosphere. But there has to be a couple of things in place for that to happen. If it's not in place, you're going to have to put it on from a bag and it's not necessarily the best form in that context. So what are the five things? Here they are here. First, the free living nitrogen fixes, the most abundant of which is called azotobacter, are the most aerobic organisms on the planet. They've got to breathe. They've got to have free 
intake of oxygen, more so than anything else. They're the most aerobic organisms on the planet. So what governs that? We just talked about it. You've got to have the soil opened up and flocculated with a good Kelmag ratio. Number two, every enzymic reaction, and we're talking about everything, every thought you take, every breath you make, every system within your body is driven by enzymes, and all of those enzymes are driven by what's now considered to be, and is called the battery of life. It's called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So it's an enzymic reaction when you create uh, nitrogenase that allows you to grab the gas and convert it into ammonium nitrogen in the soil, and so that needs an energy source, and the energy source uh, is, is a, 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 an ongoing source of soluble phosphate. Now, how's that going to happen? Our huge, almost ridiculous mistake relative to phosphate. Phosphate's triple negative. There's no minerals that are triple negative except phosphate. It's drawn to double positive and it's triply pos positive like a nail to a magnet. So you never find a bit of phosphate. You find up at Phosphate Hill, you find calcium phosphate, tricalcium phosphate, where calcium's bound with its two positives to a triple positive. And then we said, okay, let's break that bond so we don't have to cut around all the superfluous calcium and silica and so forth that's in soft rock, for example. Let's break the bond. Uh, let's pump some phosphoric or sulfuric acid which can break the bond between calcium and phosphorus and we've got water-soluble phosphate, we've got DAP and MAP. How good is that? We've got 20% P, we don't have to cut that other stuff around. And the other stuff's not actually that bad, but still. Uh, so the fatal flaw in that model was that we didn't change the nature of the beast and within 24 hours, but certainly six weeks after application, it's such a rip-off and everyone's just accepting it. The industry themselves acknowledge you get 27%. You spend a grand, you get $270 before it locks up and becomes part of what the CSIR referred to as $10 billion of locked up soil phosphate minimum, a massive frozen reserve of all the phosphate we ever used, three quarters of it still sitting there. And why wouldn't you say scam, scam, because you were conditioned to think phosphate is really important for early root growth, and it is. You need soluble phosphate to kickstart a plant, but you need 50% more as the vegetative stage progresses. And if you're in a flowering crop, you need 110% more from flowering onwards, and you don't have it at that point because it's locked up in that frozen reserve. So what we want to talk about is what would we have in our soils or in our crops or in our, in our programs to ensure a trickle feed of phosphate, two things you need. That's why fungi are so important, yet another reason. And if you test your soils, you'll see how deficient you are in beneficial fungi, because fungi release acids constantly. They're not as viciously and strongly as phosphoric and sulfuric acid, but gently break the bond between calcium and phosphate. Now, calcium and phosphate are the two most important minerals in the soil because they're the two most important minerals for photosynthesis. Uh, and so pretty important that you're constantly releasing and you need, so you need to have fungi in your soil to get to know that you've got enough soluble phosphate for the bugs to make the enzyme, to grab the gas and convert it down, number one. Number two, you've got to have legumes in the equation. Not what you're doing. Not planting for having, a, having what you call a fellow. A fellow actually technically means nothing, but you call it a fellow and put things in there. But uh, it's just a misuse of the term. But, but basically having four or five legumes every fellow, that is a really, really not a good idea. And I'll talk about the whole concept of biodiversity and legumes being part of the equation. They can be the dominant part if you're seeking nitrogen fixation, but so different. Legumes feed one group, but the good thing about legumes, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with legumes, you're not supposed to do just legumes though. It's about biodiversity. You don't just do four or five legumes. You need to have, ideally, the five species that I talked about last night to really see some major benefits. Um, but the legumes release, it's the reason all of our broadacre growers now, will, and, and Saskatchewan, for example, and the, the Victoria no-till, all of them will plant not one, but two or three low-growing clovers under this aerial crop. And what you're getting from that interplanting concept, and I'm saying I'm, I've heard the figures with the, uh, with the soil, I would prefer to see some, some, some clovers grown in that scenario before you start testing. There's a few other things that need to be in place to know that you can do that successfully. You've got to ask the right questions when you've set up the research in that context. Uh, but once you've done this once with the legumes, even in super dry land conditions, and, and Gippsland and, and, and Victoria certainly has qualified some of these seasons, uh, you find that the legumes give you four things underneath that crop, underneath your host. You're not going to harvest that, that's clover, obviously. What's it giving? It's giving you calcium, it's giving you phosphate because it's breaking the bond with its acid exudates. It's creating ideal conditions for the organisms most lacking in your soil, which are the beneficial fungi. They love those acids. They accumulate up beneath that legume. And of course, you've got some nitrogen that it fixes and gives to the host crop as well. Pretty nice outcome for the inclusion of some, some legumes. Uh, so, but even the legumes or the free-living nitrogen fixes are governed by one trace mineral, and this is the really important part I want you to remember. Who tests on your soil test for molybdenum? 
One. One. So we work in 79 countries with, uh, with teams of agronomists in all of those countries. I lecture, I train the trainers across the globe. And what you need to know is that 80% of all the soils that we test around the planet are molybdenum deficient, deficient. And what does that mean? You can't get the free gift without molybdenum. The enzyme nitrogenase is molybdenum dependent. If you haven't got half a part per million in, in your, of molybdenum and it's a leachable anion and you won't have it here, you cannot fix nitrogen, you cannot get the good ratio, you cannot get the free gift. The whole thing changes for the sake of a couple of cups of sodium molybdate. You've got to see the study done in Waitaki Council, Count, County in New Zealand on Broadacre. Crops three, crops three, two soil types uh, with the inclusion of one cup, 250 grams of sodium molybdate with their the superphosphate they're so enamoured with in that country. Uh, and the yield increases ranged from 38% was the lowest to 603% was the highest. And how do you possibly get this is nitrogen deficient broad acre crops? You unlocked the key to the door. It is hugely important. That's number one for molybdenum. You can't fix nitrogen without, from the atmosphere and convert it without the enzyme which is dependent on molybdenum. Then you've got nitrates, which is how we fertilise and how we often pump the nitrates store in the leaf and now we want them converted to protein. That is what drives the plant immunity, it's what drives animal and human immunity for that matter. And that involves another enzyme and that enzyme is called the nitrate reductase enzyme that converts nitrates through to protein. The nitrate reductase enzyme is made from molybdenum. None of you have checked it. You're in highly leachable soils. It's an anion only held by humus unless you've got 7 or 8%. You're not holding it and you've never tested it. You need to start testing for molybdenum. You also need to start testing for cobalt, which isn't anywhere near as leachable, but half of the soils we test in 59 countries are cobalt deficient and cobalt is mother's milk for nitrogen fixes. So you've just got to understand the science and get in and do this stuff and test this stuff and watch how it can be a game changer for you as it has for many tens of thousands of others. The other mineral involved, which isn't often deficient because it's the second most abundant mineral on the planet, is iron because it's molybdenum and iron that drive uh, the nitrogenase enzyme. So that's the five things. You tick the box. Did I do those? Yes, I did. Now I've got the free stuff. And that changes stuff. It changes a whole bunch of things. You need to understand that. Do you think I need to come back and do a course here at some point or you reckon you'll pick it all up now? Um, <laughs> So urea is a foliage bio. I want you to understand, I'm going to go through it again, why it is such an incredibly no-brainer strategy that you all should be embracing. How does it work? When you put urea in, so let's start off. Urea is, a, is unique. It's a form of nitrogen called the amine form of nitrogen. So just remember that word amine. You put it in the soil, it stays in amine for about one day. Uh, there's an enzyme called the urease enzyme that immediately switches it from the amine form to the ammonium form. So now it's, it's got a single charge sticking cation stuck on the clay colloid. And if there's warmth and moisture, which is usually when you use urea, then a whole bunch of organisms called nitrifying bacteria. And there's a whole thing that I teach on how can you stop them and slow them down so you can hold urea stable for longer. And that's a whole other story to be told. We haven't got time to do that at the moment, but there's four or five very, uh, very effective strategies to, uh, to, de to slow that nitrification process. So then you've got nitrates uh, and they flood into the plant with water, which dilutes everything if there's too much of them. Uh, and now you've got to convert nitrates through to protein. Now it's a three-stage process. The first stage is suggested it takes 17% of the total photosynthetic energy of the plant for that really energy intensive first stage from a nitrate to guess what? To an amine. Wait a minute, didn't we start this journey as an amine? What would happen if we bypassed? So 17% is 17%. They argued your back pocket profitability has gone through, depending on how much nitrate you've got in the equation, how much energy you had to suck from the productive potential of that plant to get to the first stage of a protein. Then the next two stages are real easy. Amines go click, amino acid, click protein. So what would happen if you bypass that 12 to 15 times more efficiently and sprayed the urea always with some humic acid to create a urea humate? And we'll talk about why humates are so important shortly. Straight through, 15 times more efficiently, bang, protein. You've got well, amino acid protein. There's nothing more efficient. It's the, I don't have no crop anywhere in the world that hasn't, when they've played around with us, said, oh my God. I was at the National Dairy Conference and two growers stood up when I was doing this same sort of talk about urea as a foliar spray. They said, we heard you a year ago. We were doing 120 kilos per six week grazing. We swapped to 20 kilos of urea with some humic acid. Changed everything. Changed our mastitis levels. It changed our pasture density. 
uh, changed animal health, our vet bills, and then another bloke stood up. So I tried that, it was a load of bloody bullshit. And I said to him, you know, there's a couple hundred people there, I said, well, did, did you spray it yourself? And he said, no, no, I got a contractor in to do it, I usually do. And I said, how long was the grass? He said, oh, the contractor said, graze it right down. That's not a foliar spray. Do you understand? That's a liquid application. It's an application of liquid nitrogen. It's not the 12 to 15 times efficiency. It's not putting an amine to click it over because as soon as it hits the soil, it turns into the ammonium form. You're not doing it unless you've gotten past your minimum four inches of grass. Now, when I talk about diversity, I really believe there's a role for animals in every scenario, and certainly there's, there's a role of some, some of the growers I've been talking about. But what you need to know is the basis of the, of the, the science now that's emerging relative, it's not like it's new, but we're rediscovering it, to how you graze and how you do that most efficiently and how you can build humus more effectively with grazing than with any other strategy. And that involves, again, learning from nature. If we ask the question, what were the most productive areas in the history of mankind, the most productive area ever, on the history of the planet in terms of producing more biomass per square, set, square metre than anywhere else ever were the Great Plains in the US, followed very closely by the Nile Valley, which we changed when we dammed the Nile Valley, of course, and we didn't have that huge flood of silt come down each year. But what drove that massive potential, without truckloads of urea, what drove that ongoing productive potential of the Great Plains? It was herds of buffalo, huge herds. You don't get choosy when you've got a predator effect and your head's next to someone else. There's massive amounts of dung and urine. Your feet creating trompling organic matter into the soil that then can be humified. Uh, this, and then, but the lesson, learning from nature, the definition of science, uh, the, the lesson is why did those herds always stop at four inches and move on? Never did they graze below four inches. What's that about? So simple. The leaf is the solar panel. Your cane, the leaf is the solar panel. And the solar panel, if you look at, if you take a pasture scenario and dig down with a spade, and if your agronomist hasn't got a spade and dirt under his fingernail, sack him because he's not an agronomist. Understand that. You can't sit in your ute and say, yeah, she looks all right, mate. You've got to get out and get into the soil. Uh, and so you dig down into a pasture scenario and have a look. If you've got six inches of pasture, you've got six inches of root that that solar panel is sustaining. You prune your pasture to four inches, the roots prune themselves to four inches. You prune it to two inches, the roots prune themselves to two inches. You prune it, prune it to a tabletop, you got nothing. <laughs> you just shut down the entire system. You're not feeding 30% of your glucose, some of which becomes humus. You haven't got all that big root system dying off constantly and turning into humus. The whole system shut down. Your dad might have said, graze it to the dirt boy, you missed out. Your dad was wrong, wake up, is what I'm suggesting to you. There is so much science now relative to the combination of pasture cropping, direct drilling multiple species into a pasture and grazing it with this mob effect. It is ridiculous. And if anyone could still sit there and look at fence line differences that I just saw, photo after photo after photo, why is a neighbour not saying, well, why the hell does his place look like mine? Because your head is so far buried and you're so indoctrinated in whatever your beliefs are that you can't even see the obvious thing in front of you. You can take a horse to water, you can't make the bloody thing drink. So uh, all I say is keep an open mind in this scenario to see what's happening across your fence and think, well, maybe I'll better have a go or learn what that is because so many people don't and I just don't even understand the mentality. But anyway, uh, that's the story of follow your rear. I'll keep moving. So climate change, as we mentioned, massive impact, the greatest challenge we've ever faced. Uh, basically, the solution that I've been screaming and now many, many scientists have cottoned on to it, when you build humus, you, you directly sequester. You can't make new humus, you can't make new carbon. Oh, I made some new carbon on my soil. Says, no, you didn't, it's impossible. There's no new carbon molecules. The same molecules have cycled since the start of time. They're in the soil, they're in living things, they're in the atmosphere, and now two thirds of what used to be in the soil is in the atmosphere. And when you build carbon, you grabbed it and put it back from where it came. And that's the saviour, saviour. That's why farmers, are so, amongst many reasons, are so important because no one can save the day except farmers in this context. And we talked about water and we, met, we mentioned 1% increase in organic matter when we talk about the new gold is 170,000 litres per hectare. You couldn't, that's a square metre, this little area here, two big buckets, 17 litres beneath the ground, held in the sponge called humus, no evaporation, no carbon footprint moving to the farm, the plant takes it as it needs it, there is nothing comes close in terms of water management efficiency to this wonderful substance called humus. So let's talk about how we can build our humus. Number one, how am I going time-wise? I reckon I'm only about a quarter way through. I've got five minutes left. Okay, <laughs> typical. Um, 
So let's go whipping our way through uh, some of the things. Now, if you've gone to the effort of perhaps, in your case, building these, doing these massive leguminous, or you call them fallows, but leguminous cover crops, uh, or you've got a multi-species or whatever you've grown, uh, the, 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 the tendency is to burn it off with a herbicide. Now, there's something to, real, to understand here. If you're growing nitrogen, for example, as you're doing with your legumes, uh, there is actually three minerals involved here, and they're all pretty important. Sulfur is deficient in every soil I look at almost. It's, it's, it's only held by humus. It's an anion. We used to get it for free. It poured out from smokestacks, and then we had something called acid rain that killed entire waterways and forests, and we banned sulfur emissions. We've lost two-thirds of our humus, and we don't get the stuff for free anymore. You've got to have sulfur. You can't make protein that drives plant immunity without sulfur. So, uh, protein, sorry, proteins are made from amino acids, and the two most important amino acids are called cysteine and methionine. And they're made from sulfur. You've got to do sulfur. You've got to check on your soil test and make sure the sulfur and sulfur and phosphorus are one to one. That's one of the ratios that we've found to be most effective. You aim so a lot. That means 30, 40, 50 parts per million of sulfur is the amount that works, so huge in that context. But so sulfur has a gaseous form, nitrogen has, the, and carbon of course goes up as CO2, and when you burn it off, that's what happens. Most of that material that you just grew, you went all the effort of growing that stuff, should be back in your soil, you off-gassed because you burned it off. So it's much better, even though no-till's got so much to support it, a minimum till scenario where you just work in the A horizon and convert those three minerals uh, into something stable. That's number one. Number two is legumes. We've already talked about the reasons for putting legumes, obviously in every pasture, but under every cereal crop, and all of our growers globally do exactly that and get some tremendous results. We talked about the reasons, crumb structure, oxygen, uh, fungal stimulation, phosphorus, nitrogen, and calcium delivered by that legume under planting in a cereal scenario. If it's a legume you're growing, like your legumes, if you are going to grow straight legumes, then you put grasses under the legumes, two or three different grasses under that legumes. That's how the multi-species deal works. We'll talk more about it. In fact, we're talking about it now. We talked about the finding from Dr. Adamir Caligari, uh, basically, of the inclusion of five families and the difference it makes, and four of them won't do it. It's at five families, and the missing one is called chenopods, or kenopods, the Americans call it. Everything from the beet family, quinoa, amaranth, and spinach, that's it, it's a small group. You only need 1%, so it's not a big investment of the kenopods. You need about 5 to 6% of brassicas and no more, because they pour out biochemicals that will kill and affect things like mycorrhizal fungi on the roots. Um, and so that's, they're going to be inclusion. And the finding is when and only when the five are included, the plant roots begin messaging and there's a pouring and a measurable, demonstrably measurable outpouring of phenolic compounds into the soil, which just like when we drink green tea, those things are pretty good for our 10 trillion cells. The soil life, single and multicellular creatures respond in a similar way and go into hyperdrive. And people are describing the response of three to four cover crops in terms of changes in soil structure in a single cover cropping season. I can, demonstrate, I can show you my own farm, the difference that's made on the field, one of my ginger fields, where I put a really ordinary soil the home farm. I've been working, you know, I've got a lot of work to do, and I've done on some of the soil I've improved, and still a lot of work to do, but the difference for that five species, and I had 20, total of 20, I had to go hard, look everywhere to try and find bear seed. If you want a source of bear seed, uh, the mate who co-presented, one of the best farmers I've ever shared the stage with, Grant Sims from the Victorian No-Till, he makes, and hundreds of tonne lots now, multi-species cover crops, include, and they're all bare seed. You don't want fungicides on your seed if you want to start this biological journey. Uh, anyway, so just ask me if you want his details. Um, humates, who uses humic and fulvic acid? Just to get a bit of a feel for how widely understood these are. My goodness. I'll tell you honestly, that's the lowest number of people that I've ever spoken to in the last five years have gotten, I don't know why that is in this industry. I mean, it's the biggest single growth thing in agriculture, full stop, not regenerative, full stop. Have a look at the figures. Google them tonight and see. And if you've not discovered the benefits of humic and fulvic acid, you're in for some, a lot of fun. I'll explain quickly what they are. When you make it, so humic and fulvic acid are natural acids, not some kind of man-made thing that are found in humus. So if you've got high humus in your soil, which you don't have, but if you did have and it was alive, then it's got lots of humic and fulvic acid found in that, in that material. When you compost, the better you compost, the higher the percentages of humic and fulvic acid you created when you composted. They're the two powerhouse acids that do everything that humus does in a concentrated form. And the exciting thing about them is this discovery you can take ancient organic matter in the form of certain types of brown coal, and with the use of things like potassium hydroxide, you can extract those two acids in a liquid-soluble form. And then, 
and we, we were the first in the world to invent it. Now the whole world does it. We did it 20, 24 years ago. We said the problem with humic acid is that it's only, because it's only soluble in alkaline conditions. It's a weird acid. Fulvic acid is genuinely acidic. Humic acid is only, so that means you've got to use potassium hydroxide. That means humic acid has a pH of 11 because it's still got the potassium tied to it. It's called a potassium humate. All humic acids are called potassium humates. But what you've done effectively is concentrate up that really all of the things that humus does in a single liquid. So let's talk about a couple or two or three things. There are a dozen things, and we haven't got time because I've only got five minutes, but let's just talk about what humic acid is. Number one, nine published papers, you can Google them, it's called cell, and both humic and fulvic acid. So the difference between humic and fulvic acid, one is more oxidised and one's 10 times smaller. Fulvic acid is 10 times smaller molecular size than humic. So fulvic can leach, humic can't. Now that's a pretty good story of something that can grab hold of things, hold them and not leach. It's not hard to think that might be a good thing on the reef, and it amazes me that you've not gone there. There is so much science relative to this. Just start googling the papers on it. That's the obvious way to stop nitrogen leaching on the reef because you put urea and humic acid together, instantly you've created a urea humate that can't leach, can't volatize. You stabilized your, humate, your, your urea in that instance. It's just kind of like a no-brainer, and I've not seen this many people, and I talk to as many as 2,000 people at a time who have not even heard of this stuff. Why well, you're going to have some fun when you get into this and see what you can achieve. So, so number one, you've got the stabilising effect. So, so lights, and the light sandy soil, for example, you can grab hold of stuff. You, can, you put it with a phosphate, you've got a phosphate humor. You put it with boron, you've got a boron humor. You can't leach boron. So you foliage spray boron, you're always going to put a bit of humic acid with it. Uh, it's the phenomenon that applies to both humic and fulvic is called cell sensitization. Again, I know of seven published papers, there may be more. Uh, cell sensitization means that things go in through the cell wall and then there's the cell membrane, and the membrane becomes more permeable so it can absorb 30 to 34% more when you, can, when you put humic acid with anything. Now, fulvic acid, the only problem is humic acid is not compatible with everything because it's alkaline and everything's acidic, except urea. It's a perfect partner. It goes immediately with urea and forms a stable urea humate that's uptaken 30 to 34% more effectively. You put it with phosphate, phosphate can't do what it does. Within 24 hours, start grabbing with its three negatives, grabbing out of calcium because you form a phosphate humate immediately. And now, for the full season, you've got phosphate availability. Really easy to do leaf tests and see how long half the paddock that you treated and half the other half you didn't, how long the phosphate lasts in terms of delivery to the plant with tissue testing, and you'll see that instantly. And you'll never, ever use water-soluble phosphate without stabilising and complexing it with humic acid granules. 5%, 100 kilos of urea, 5 kilos of soluble humate granules is, is the use of it. But both of those minerals, one being 10 times smaller than the other, uh, the problem with humic is you cannot, can't mix it with many things. Boron, soluble, and not boric acid. And, and, and urea are the two things. So we said, okay, let's, now the whole world does it. We were the first with this as well. We said, okay, let's take it, sun dry it, and now we use kiln drying. They make the liquid from the brown coal with the potassium hydroxide, break it, dry it up to crystals, break it up to two to four, and now you can put it with anything. And it dissolves at the same rate. Now you've got a phosphate humate or a urea humate or whatever. You can grab all your potassium humate with the potassium and MPK and so forth. Uh, so you've stable ammonium humate you can form that won't leach. Uh, so that's, that's done that job. Uh, fulvic acid is genuinely acidic. The way that you make humic fulvic acid, you could do it yourself, and people do. In fact, that broad acre farmer does do it himself. He dries it in for 50 bucks a tonne, the brown coal, uh, and makes his own humic and fulvic acid in massive tanks. and makes many wonderful things of his own biofertilizers. He takes all of his trace minerals uh, and he has these 5,000 litre tanks and he'll say, okay, I'm going to put zinc into this one. Then he puts a fermenting brew with molasses and he has a bottle of Coke coming out of the top. And it's a bottle of water and a Coke bottle and, it's, and, the, and, the, and the bubbles, water's bubbling and when it stops bubbling, the fermentation's finished. So you've got this living fertilizer. You put the microbes behind the minerals. Why is that important? I'm digressing, but there's so much you need to know. Why would you never put out a microbial brew, whether it's a do-it-yourself compost tea or any other specific nitrogen-fixing brew or disease control brew? Why would you never do it by itself? Because you've wasted an opportunity. The same reason that if you understand, for example, every man in this room, the importance of zinc, I'm halfway through a book on prostate health because no one even knows why they've got a prostate, let alone how to protect it. But the most important mineral for your prostate by far is zinc. And you should be taking 30 milligrams of zinc in a bottle beside your bed every night from now till the last day of your life, and that will be a long way further ahead should you decide to do that. 
It's massive. In fact, my latest blog that comes out tomorrow will describe the six things you need to do to protect yourself from this pandemic plague, to boost your immunity to its absolute peak. And they're not hard, but you need to know about them because it looks awfully, without getting grim, like we are in the midst of a pandemic. Now, people have talked about it forever that we're way overdue. I don't know if you saw the figures from 10 Cent, which are, is Australia's kind of Google equivalent, but 10 days ago, they published the real figures, it appears, and then pulled them down when the government stomped on them 10 minutes later. Whether someone was trying to tell the world what was really happening or whether they did it by accident, no one knows. But the figures at that point, and of course it will be another 40% higher in 10 days because that's the growth rate of the thing, were 129,000 people and 29,000 deaths. So it's not 3% at all, it's over 20%. And that's what every virologist said it looks like. With every dynamic of this bug, it looks like it should be about a one in five death rate with it. Well, that's what it is, if that is the case. But three weeks now, where you can have it and not know and pass it, that's the hallmarks of a pandemic. I can't see, personally, how we can avoid it. So get in there and take care of some of the things that are required. Uh, read that latest blog. If you want to sign up for the blog, I haven't got anything there. I usually bring a sheet. Anyway, you can email me. I'll give, I'll give you cards and so forth. I'll keep moving. Um, so, keep moving quickly. What's that? <laughs> Lunch has been served. Do I have to finish up now? That'd be great if you could. I, I, look, I would love to sit here. If you guys want to stay, I'm happy to go out and tell them we'll be another 10 or 15 minutes. We probably won't have time to take questions and we will be doing the trial presentations now after lunch. But you've all been so transfixed. Everyone's taking notes. I've never seen a crowd this size not take their eyes off the stage and the screen. Seriously, every single one of you. So I know you, you, you want to keep going. Um, just tell me how long. Keep going. Keep going. There you go, Graham. You got the word. OK. So uh, humates massive. So, so we mentioned the, the other big thing about if we need fungi, and you all need fungi, then you say, OK, what stimulates fungi and what stimulates bacteria? Most powerful food for bacteria is fulvic acid, 10 times smaller, smaller creature, much more much less complex the carbohydrates and fulvic acid, so bacteria go crazy. Most powerful known bacterial stimulant. And that can be really handy to clean up your soil. In, in Holland, uh, was our Dutch, uh, I've got a whole team of, they charged 200 bucks an hour, 200 euros an hour, and they're booked out. This is regenerative agriculture, uh, ag uh, agronomists that I've trained in, in Holland. Um, but they, but they discovered that if you go for organic certification in Holland, then they check, you know, the 120, 177 chem chemicals that they test in your soil. And of course, everyone's got residues, everyone uses chemicals. And so then you've got to go two years with no chemicals before you can go into in conversion for three years. So who's going to do it? Because you're not getting any extra premium. In conversion, you're getting almost, sometimes almost the same as, as if you were converted. So you can justify, you know, going down the path, but you've got to go two years with no. So what they discovered, if you take high dose, they use our soluble fulvic acid powder, super concentrate, and we usually use half a kilo per hectare. They use three kilos per hectare, and six weeks later they retest, and most times you get through certification. So it's a clean-up technique that I suggest to everyone, you test on your own farm. You've used a whole bunch of chemicals, and most of us have, then you, many people say, oh, the soils aren't what they used to be, and your dad will say, well, they're not what they used to be, and so forth. Part of that can be the accumulation of chemicals, and if you test that there, look at, this, look at our CSIRO testing of how many tank loads of, uh, of, um, of herbicides particularly were still found in the soils a year or two later. So they compromise biology and they compromise performance, and it's a good idea to see if it's worth cleaning up. So find an area you know you put a lot of chemicals on, do 100 square metres, take three tablespoons, it's about a dollar's worth, of that soluble fulvic acid powder, which coming back from three kilos is how much you need, 30 grams, um, and test it. And if you see a transformation, that's all that many people do, then you can spend 60 bucks and do the whole plat to, to, per hectare and do the plat place sort of thing, but just check it first and see if that does give you that clean up potential. Fulvic acid, so a, a sandy soil's got a CC of three, four, a clay, a medium soil, 20, a heavy clay soil, 30, 35, 40. Uh, humus, 250, how important was it? Humus to hold stuff in light soils. Uh, humic acid, that concentrate, 450 cc. And fulvic acid, 1400. There's nothing really comes close to that. Uh, and that means it grabs and sucks things in. And when you use it, that's how it detoxes. It sucks things in. And the things that, it's the most powerful bacterial stimulant. What breaks down 
chemicals in your soil are bacteria, not fungi. Bacteria do most of the biodegradation of chemicals. They're attracted, and you might not remember, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. You might be a little too young for Mary Poppins, but there's a new one coming out shortly. But that's basically what fungi becomes, that spoonful of sugar that brings in the bugs, uh, fast tracks the biodegradation, and unfortunately, I suppose for others or whatever, uh, it grabs hold of things, and then if it can't be broken down by bacteria, it leaches, because fulvic leaches, humic doesn't. And now you've got a clean soil. But that can be a tremendous value that may be worth considering uh, in that context. So, um, so but for humic acid is the most powerful known fungal system. You can take a pile of wood chip and you can dilute some humic acid and pour it on there and leave half test, half, you know, a sec second pile of wood chip and one that you've treated and come back two weeks later and kick apart that wood chip and there'll be seven strands, different coloured strands of fungi working their way through there and you kick the other one, there's a couple of little pale coloured things moving through there. It's ridiculously impactful, it's stimulating fungi and that's what everyone's lacking, that's what we all need, particularly mycorrhizal fungi. Who's heard of mycorrhizal fungi before? So most of you, which is good. So mycorrhizal fungi burrow into the root, expand out and give us 10 times the original root surface area with this massive extension of tiny invisible filaments. You can't see them unless you dye them and look under a microscope and see all these little strands coming off. And that's hugely important for a lot of things. I mean, the most immobile of all minerals are phosphorus and zinc. And so these hyphae will go out and grab those immobile minerals and deliver phosphorus and, and zinc uh, to your crop. Uh, the, that big network of tiny filaments is releasing acids and breaking the bond between calcium and phosphate and grabbing both those minerals and bringing them back to look after its host. Produces five biochemicals that stimulate plant immunity and anything that boosts immunity boosts yields. So how good is it to get mycorrhizal fungi? But the big one, because the most destructive of all farm chemicals, um, both in terms of the ozone layer in this instance and farmer health, it does more harm than any other chemical in nematicides. And how's this for a nematocyte? It is impossible to have a root not nematode on a plant colonised with mycorrhizal fungi. You cannot have the two coexist on the same root. So forget about your 3,000 bucks a hectare for an nematocyte, get some mycorrhizal fungi out there and get them doing their work. And, you know, of all of those benefits, and there are multiple other benefits, including potassium. You know, potassium is a very small ionic radius that can fit between clay platelets. And you, in many instances, you don't get, until, it's like a sandwich, and until you put enough potassium in the equation to fill the sandwich and get it oozing, you don't get any potassium, but mycorrhizal fungi will drive their hyphae into that fine platelet and mine out the potassium, very expensive mineral you got for nothing now. Uh, so tremendous, but its biggest claim to fame is huge relative to this challenge that we all face because Dr. Sarah Wright, I touched on it yesterday, discovered in 1996 a substance called glomalin, a sticky substance produced only by the glomalus strain, which is the most common strain of mycorrhizal fungi found in every soil. And that sticky substance we now know is responsible for 30% of all the humus in the soil, one creature and 90% of them are gone. Bring them back, for God's sake. Get every government in there giving you uh, uh, 50 bucks. It's all it costs. It costs 20 bucks to get reasonable colonisation. But you can't put them in and just kill them off again. So you've got to say, well, some things like nematicides won't be allowable because they're the most destructive. There's no known nematicide that doesn't kill every form of mycorrhizal fungi. So there are changes coming relative to what we can and should be using. So humates magnify, increase the uptake, you know, if you want a collated trace mineral, say most of you are neglecting completely your trace minerals. And if you start doing a tissue test, then you'll see what I'm talking about and what you should be doing with foliar sprays and how you do that cheaply. I mean, I can sell you all the fancy collated trace minerals. You can make them yourself for very, very little. When we look at all the different forms of collation, the most effective natural collating compound by far is a substance called fulvic acid. And fulvic acid is soluble with everything, compatible with everything. So you'd, if you need some zinc, and zinc's pretty important if you're growing cane, because what does zinc govern? It governs the production of oxens. Oxens govern how big the leaf is, how big the solar panel is, how much sugar you're producing. So you never, ever want to be zinc deficient in a cane crop. So if you find your zinc deficient, you take some zinc sulfate, you put some folic acid, that creates a zinc folate, uptaken, collated. So what's collate mean? The word, some people say chelate, but it's pronounced chelate. That word in Greek means claw. So if you take, say you, you know what your crop looks, oh, I've got a zinc deficiency, I'm going to spray some zinc sulfate. Why wouldn't you? Why would you spend four or five or seven times more on collated zinc rather than just spraying out the zinc sulfate, because here's why. The plant surface is strongly negatively charged. Zinc is a positively charged cation. You spray it, you're trying to get in that tiny little mouth called a stomate. There's a rush, there's a traffic jam, and you get 8% of the 36.2% zinc and zinc sulfate monohydrate. That's all you get. You traffic jam, you blocked it, you can't get it in. 
the chelating agent, the chlor, whether it's EDTA, an unnatural material is now called a POP, which means it stays in your soil and causes problems, a persistent organic pollutant, versus the most powerful natural chelating agent, which is this fulvic acid. Every shed needs a bag of fulvic acid. You take your zinc, you put two, 300 grams of powder in, you've got a zinc fulvate, and woof, you're in the plant and your job's done as efficiently as you could ever do it. So that's just a standard thing. All of our growers will make their own chelated trace minerals in that fashion. Anyway, we better keep moving. A compost, why is compost so important? I mentioned Ron Nichols, my mate who runs the soil health division of the US Ag Department, and he shared with me a really good example of why in this particular scenario, compost is so important. They took one tonne per acre on three sites, uh, sorry, over three years in multiple sites in two states in the US. So they added one tonne per acre. Now, one tonne per acre is like if you've put compost in your garden, it's like the real fine sprinkle. It's not a lot, two and a half tonnes a hectare. Uh, but it's just a little barely visible sprinkle. But they did that on multiple sites in two states. Now, here's the deal. To build carbon in the top six inches of a soil, it takes six tonnes. We're talking per acres because they're talking acres here. Per acre, six tonnes, which is 15 tonnes per hectare of pure carbon in the top six inches to build 1% organic matter. So just understand that. So compost is about 30% carbon. So it takes about 20 tonnes of compost per acre, 50 tonnes a hectare, to take 2% to 3%. Now, they put on one tonne an acre for three years. That's three tonnes in total, and it takes 20 tonnes to build 1%. So three tonnes is about what you actually put on in terms of stable carbon when you made your compost and you made humus and you put it out there, you added 0.15%. So that's what the soil test should have revealed. The average increase in organic matter from one tonne per acre was 1.36%. How the hell did you get nine times more than what you put on there? Because that's what compost with 30,000 creatures and that massive biodiversity adds back to your soil. It allows you to reclaim the potential, to take some of the glucose exudates, to take some of the residues of trash in this instance and convert them to humans. That's the big role of compost and it makes it almost as important as humates in this story. And we've got so many people. And I teach you how to do something called anaerobic compost and there's no work. It's really, really simple. You don't turn it. You just set up your pile. I can't do that now. But uh, minimising tillage, um, as we talked about that. Uh, the only problem with no-till, which is absolutely demonstrably the best way to go, or minimum till, I prefer minimum to no-till, just don't make a religion of it. If you've got a, you get stratification, the, particularly in wet climates, the minerals will move down so the young plant doesn't get them initially as well as it could. So occasionally you turn and you bring them up to the surface again and so forth. And if you've got earthworms happening, they'll be doing that for you. Um, but the problem with, with, the only problem with, uh, no-till, basically, is that it's glyphosate-dependent. And, you know, and you know, I know with Bayer's a, a sponsor and so forth, but it has to be said that it's not going to be here. I think they know that. They've got 52,000 lawsuits against them at the moment, and the last two were a billion dollars each, so it's not a good story. Um, but uh, glyphosate is not a good chemical. You need to understand. You might think it's a load of crap. Just go and research it in depth and see. I'm going to talk a little bit about it, probably not what you want to hear. Uh, first of all, it started with a great mate of mine, Professor Don Huber, again, 306 peer-reviewed published papers, he's no halfwit, uh, and, a, and a redneck, voted for Donald Trump, used to work developing nerve agent gases. I mean, he's not like some kind of tree-hugging hippie. We're talking about a serious uh, redneck, basically, and he would call himself that himself. He wouldn't mind me saying that. Um, but wonderful man, a wonderful hero, in my opinion. Um, but basically, he said, well, why do you get this? You can see that thing there on the soybean. That's called yellow flash. That's Roundup-ready soybean. Why? And you analyse it, and it's lacking manganese. And people said, oh, yeah, well, so glyphosate was first developed as a collating agent to haul manganese off the inside of boilers and in, in heavy industry. So maybe it's, it's, it's actually locking up manganese in the plant. And Don said, nah. Of course, he's got, you know, he's a plant phys 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 physiologist. physiologist. He's a, uh, he's a micro microbiologist and a whole bunch of other things. He's got several doctorate degrees, as the same as Phil Callahan we mentioned. And he said, no, I reckon, and he was the first to show that glyphosate on contact kills a group of organisms called manganese-reducing organisms that deliver manganese to the crop. It also kills, not as viciously, but almost as viciously, a second group called iron-reducing organisms. And he showed, for example, um, where just 2.5% of the diluted glyphosate reached the soil, there was an 80% reduction of manganese uptake and a 50% reduction in the uptake of iron. And you might say, well, ah, just in significant trace minerals, think again. If you look at the study of plant immunology, which is a massive dynamic study and really important, because if you can use immunolicitors in your program, watch what happens to yield. There is no known immunolicitor that doesn't boost yield. And what you need to know, this has been filmed, so I'll probably not say it. 
<laughs> I, was, I was with an organisation, I won't mention their name, who are responsible for uh, every fungicide test and every fungicide that's ever come into Australia. And I was with a couple of their scientists having a couple of wines, and I guess loose lips can sink ships, but they told me that in 50 years combined experience of science with this organisation testing every fungicide that ever come into this country, they have found not one that didn't substantially reduce yield. And no one got told that, because the mode of action of fungicides, the opposite of immune elicitation, is immune inhibition. And anything that, that reduces immune capacity reduces yield. And you weren't told that. Yeah, you probably did do better if you didn't, if you didn't get powdery mildew on this and you did in that or whatever. But if you had a healthy crop uh, and you didn't have disease pressure because you took care of soil health and plant health, uh, you're going to have much better yields without fungicides. And the most successful agronomist in Canada, uh, Pascal, you can't work with him. He's got a 21.7% yield increase. He doesn't care about anything else. You can't use fungicides. You can't have treated seeds. You can't use fungicides if you're going to work with him because he knows the deal. Anyway... Uh, some of the findings with glyphosate, chronic illness, they find blood testing, you're going to have much higher levels if you've got an illness you can't get rid of, that's what chronic illness is. Uh, beneficial gut bacteria really hard. Now it's mode of action, just so you know. There's three modes of action. The principal mode of action, is, here's the most widely used chemical in the world and no one knows how, how it works. It shuts down something called the shikimate pathway. And you might say, well, what's that and why is that important? Shikimate pathway governs the production of two amino acids that are integral to the immune systems of every creature on the planet except mammals, and that's how they got away with it, because mammals don't have a shikimate pathway. No worries, mate, we haven't got one. So what we did, without exaggerating, was give a form of AIDS to everything, including the plant, and then the plant can't resist and it dies from whatever's there, opportunistic to kill it. That's what kills them. Here's how you test this concept. Take some tomato plants, uh, take some soil, some potting mix or, or some soil and put it in the microwave. It's the only place you should ever put it. Never food in that microwave, but you put it in the microwave, kill everything or put chlorine in it, just kill everything. So it's completely sterile. Nothing good, nothing bad. Then spray glyphosate and you cannot kill that crop because how you kill the plant is that you shut down its immune system and any opportunistic pathogen comes in and kills it. That's how it dies. And then you'll understand that's its mode of action. Shut down the shikimate pathway of the plant and the plant dies with anything. Uh, so then you'll see that how it works. But the fatal flaw and say, no worries, mate. We don't have a shikimate pathway. Wait a minute. We're a community of 10 trillion interrelated cells, but we've got 100 trillion of them that govern every aspect of our health, including our mental.